No fewer than 27 fishermen have been reportedly slaughtered and three others abducted by the Jama'at al-Suna Lid Dawa Wal Jihad, a Boko Haram terrorist group on the border between Cameroon and Algeria. The terrorists, suspected to be from the Buduma faction of the Abu Umayma, attacked a local fishing community harboring mostly fishermen from Nigeria at island Kofia near Darak in the Republic of Cameroon. They tied their hands behind their backs before slaughtering them. The sources said the terrorists also abducted three other fishermen after accusing them of spying for the ISWAP faction. The bodies of the fishermen were later discovered during a search and rescue operation by troops and their colleagues. Now still talking security, bandits are reportedly demanding 5 million naira as ransom for the two kidnapped victims that were taken to Umogidi at Umogidi community in the Antekba Council Ward in Otupo local government area of Benue State, North Central Nigeria. Two farmers were said to have been killed and two others were injured. Locals say the deceased recently fled their homes due to a similar attack but decided to go to their farms in Umogidi when they were killed on Tuesday. The other three were also said to be on their farms when the bandits attacked them and took away one of them while the other two were reported to have been injured. Now to discuss this further, I'm being joined by Melvin Edger, a security expert and executive director of Global Peace and Life Rescue Initiative. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, looking at the events leading up to the kidnapping and the motivation behind the individuals returning to their farms despite the previous kidnappings in the area, what precautions did the farmers take or were they supposed to take before returning to their farms in an area that's actually known for kidnappings? Let me first and um, first uh, condole with the people of Benin State, the governor, the executive governor of Benin State, Reverend Father Harrison Talia, the good people of Zone C and the entire people of Benin State for this wanton destruction of life that is going on by these criminal marauders who have made up their mind to ensure that Many people, by extension, as you can see, are annihilated from their own land. Well, the farmers on their own do not really have anything to do. They behave on the security to act fast. It behaves on the security to be more proactive to ensure that the people, people's lives are saved in that very community. The Umogiri community have been known for notorious fact. Have been, the notorious fact is that these bandits have taken over that community for a very long time. Though the security are taking some action, at least the men of the Operation Y Stroke are taking some action to ensure that these bandits are wiped from that, that terrain. But I think the Operation Y Stroke are understaffed. They are on their, they, they have limited resources, they have limited uh, logistics, and they have limited men to police that, to, to, to conduct that area. That area is known for the notorious activities of these bandits. If you look at Mogidi, it could be a part and other communities in Otupo local government, a part local government, a Gato local government have been under siege for a very long time. And I must say this very clearly that the people are suffering at this point in time because of the activities of these bandits. So I think the community is not really having to say the burden lies on the security to ensure that they get more deployment, they ensure that they clear our forest of these bad bandits. This is their land. I wonder why they can't live in their land peacefully and sleep with their eyes closed. They commit no offense by belonging to that land, by belonging to that, that community. So I think, I don't think it's their responsibility to do anything before going back to their, 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 their land. They, of course, they are farmers. They need to go back and begin to farm. The farming season is here. So they need to go back to their community. Why would they be prevented from going back to the community by this criminal? Why would they be prevented? This is my pain as I speak today now. Now, instead of the stakeholders in Benin State to come together to support the government to ensure that these bandits are cleared, to support the government to ensure that this problem is solved, they they are playing politics and calling the governor names, trying to blame the governor. This is not the time for blame game. This is time to ensure that the security uh, uh, of lives uh, uh, are properly. All right, you say, you're saying that, you know, uh, the government isn't doing anything at the moment to, you know, try to rescue these uh, victims. So no attempt is being made by local authorities or even security forces to negotiate with the bandits or even track them down or even, kid, uh, you know, rescue the kidnapped. Is that what you're saying? No, I, I did not, I've not, I've not said so. I said the government is doing a lot, the security agents are doing a lot, even though the, act, the action may be limited now because of the lack of trend, because of lack of uh, logistics on, the, on their part. But negotiation is out of it. I, do, I would not advise any security agencies to negotiate with this bandit. They must go after them and rescue these innocent farmers 
who are already in pain. Nobody should negotiate with these criminals. They are doing a lot. Some of the strategy they are, they, are, they are carrying out cannot be discussed here on the public television. I do not think it's very simple. I think the government of the state, the Benin State government, the special advisor, and uh, the apparatus of government in Benin State are doing a lot to rescue these people from the hand of these criminal marauders. But the strategy will not be disclosed here on public television because they're actually security information. I think the government is doing enough. The security agencies, I want to comment particularly Operation Wise Stroke. I, I think I need more of these personnel. I need them to deploy more personnel to Benin State. Benin State do not have sufficient strength of these military men. Military men in Benin State are very small. We, the, the battalion, the battalion, the brigade in Benin, in Benin and the Wise Stroke are not enough to cover the myriad of challenges we have in Benin. So I think I'm calling on the Chief of Defense Staff, the Chief of Army Staff to make more deployment to Benin. These, these men are doing their best, but they can't, you can't give what you don't have. They, they are not enough. They can't cover everywhere. They can't be everywhere. So I think we need more deployment in Benin State. I'm, I'm appealing to him to ensure that more soldiers are deployed to Benin State to curtail these this, this insurgents. Only the Nigerian military can effectively challenge them. Other security agencies are doing their best. They're also trying. But I think the superior power this minute these guys come with, I think we need more soldiers in our terrain, particularly the Mogidi community, the Apa community, the Agatu community, to ensure that these criminals are cleared from our terrain. All right, so you're talking about, you know, uh, getting more soldiers to be able to safeguard, you know, uh, some of the communities. You actually did list some of them earlier. Are you saying that having soldiers is enough safety measure, you know, in, that a community can actually put in place to be able to safeguard them? Especially talking about communities and other communities within the Umogidi area, you know, that have a history of kidnappings in the region. Will that be enough? I think Umogiri, Umogiri is just one community in, in Benue South, it's well in Tupu local government, it's just one community. Uh, there are several of these incidents in those communities around Benue State, around, around, around Zuti. So what I enjoy the community to do on that part is to create local vigilante, is to ensure that they get vigilante who, who also, who also create, give them local intelligence to, to know the whereabouts of this, of, of this criminal. However, the coming in of military men we do a lot. It will actually calm down the situation. It is only the military guys, these criminals fear. So I think I want, I'm appealing for more deployment. And stakeholders in Benin should come together and support the performing governor of Benin City. The governor is doing so much, but I think the governor as he stands today is being frustrated by even agents of the state who ought to be supporting the government. Government, the government, government, the government is, being, is being frustrated by people who are rather playing politics instead of fighting, coming together and fighting this insecurity. For me, some of this insecurity, I think they actually instigated. Some of these criminals, marauders, were invited to our community to, to come and kill our people because the people don't, who don't, who don't, who don't like the government. So, my appeal to people are you saying it's a my form of ethnic all cleansing? these people that are in military that they should come together to ensure that they support our government. Look, when it has to do with security, we must put our difference away. We must ensure that we put all our difference away and so secure the life for our people. The poor farmers, what they give five million from to pay for their, their rescue? Where are they going to get the money from? It's not possible. It is not practical. They don't have the money from anywhere. They are just poor farmers. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Melvin, for joining me and speaking to me on this. Thank you very much for having me. All right. A pleasure. Now, in the days that followed the kidnapping of schoolgirls in Chipok, frenetic journalism ensued the world over. TV stations and newspapers from the United States to the United Kingdom followed the story. For News Central's Afia Hagen looks at the international coverage of the kidnapping. The April 2014 kidnap of 276 girls from their school in Chibok by militant group Boko Haram immediately garnered global attention. A group of Nigerian women launched the social media campaign hashtag bring back our girls which became a powerful worldwide protest attracting the support of the then US First Lady Michelle Obama, the Nobel Peace Laureate Malala Yousafzai and various celebrities. The then president of Nigeria, Goodluck Jonathan, received immediate offers of help from the US, Britain, France and China. It was covered in newsrooms the world over. Karen Chambers is a journalist who worked on the story at the time. She says it took a while to convince senior figures in her newsroom that it was worth talking about. Myself and some other women in the newsroom were encouraging essentially the male journalists, who those who are in charge, to really take this seriously. And when I looked at other Western media coverage of the story, 
as a woman, I have to say I was horrified because there just wasn't enough emphasis put on the fact that these were missing children. They were in an environment where they should be safe. They were in a school and they'd been taken by militants and it was seen as, well, that's the end of that. And it's like, no, we need to start talking about this. But whilst the coverage was necessary to highlight the plight of these 276 girls, it was a double-edged sword. The Western media viewed the kidnap of young women at school through the lens of gender-based violence and denial of education, rather than the lens of growing insecurity and banditry in Nigeria. The Chibok kidnapping happened during a period in which world leaders were focused on assaults on female education in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria and Iraq. This kidnapping fit that narrative, as does the group's name, which literally means Western education is forbidden. Anything else was written off. It made a superstar out of Boko Haram leader Abubakar Shakao, who was once just a fringe figure. It solidified the Boko Haram global brand, who thrived on the headlines. Looking back now, Chamber says Boko Haram became the story, rather than the kidnapped girls. They were seen as the new kids on the block. They were seen as perhaps the new ISIS, the new Al-Shabaab. And all of a sudden, the, there, was a, there was a hunt from Western media to find out who are they, what are they about, and what do they stand for. And actually, the story of the girls kind of got lost and kind of was missing within that piece. Ten years on, it's thought that around 90 girls taken from Chibok are still missing. The world's media have moved on, but in the meantime, banditry and kidnapping continues. Schools continue to be targeted, particularly in remote areas of the north, where security is lax and kidnappers can escape into vast forests. More than 1,500 schoolchildren have been abducted since 2014. Global coverage of heinous crimes such as the kidnap of 276 schoolgirls is always necessary to honour the victims and to spur governments to act. But making sure the reporting is accurate and doesn't just fit a narrative to truly tell a story is paramount. For News Central, I'm Afia Hagen. Thank you, Afia, for that report. Now, the Marine Police of Anambra State Command has recovered the bodies of the three remaining victims of the unfortunate boat accident of the Nollywood film crew who drowned in the River Niger while returning to Asaba from a movie location in Anam, Anambra State. News Central correspondent Austin Azu, who has been following the tragedy, tells us more. <laughs> Junior Pope and some other cast and crew on a movie production he was involved in were returning to Asaba from a movie location in Anam, Anambra State, when the mishap occurred. This is obviously not the best of times for the Nigeria film industry that has witnessed a number of deaths of practitioners recently. Nollywood industry practitioners have converged on the bank of the marine water site at Cable Point in Asaba, waiting for the divers who have gone in search of the remains. The Anambra State Police Command, in a press statement by the police public relations officer, revealed that two of the bodies were recovered on Thursday night, while the last was washed in by the tide this morning. <laughs> Most members of the Nollywood industry who kept watch throughout the night at the Marine Cable Point water side said three out of the five involved in the boat mishap have been buried by the river shore along the River Niger. The third newsman that some traditional rites were performed for the corpse of Junior Pope and other crew members to be taken to their various states for proper burial. Last night, we were here to like um, 8.39, where they crossed to go and bury the other two corpses that was, find, that was found. Rather, we came back this early morning, we've gone to the mortuary because one of the families said um, they have to bring their child to Abia State. We, we, one of your colleagues was raising money for that, to take him to Abia State. We came and buried the last corpse across the water just now. Some Hollywood actors and actresses who expressed deep pains about the recent unfortunate accidents that has been happening in the industry advocated the seeking of spiritual solutions to the situation. The sacrifice of Gina Pope's life will not go without all of us understanding what is right and wrong, what we should and should not do. And the most important thing I want everyone to know is that life is nothing 
If anybody offend you, let me hear your ball. Forgive. Let's keep moving and help each other. I'm begging everyone. Nollywood, we have had enough. We pray, we don't see anymore. Juno Pop Odomodo is my brother, not only a friend, who are from the same place, Enugu State, Nsoka Nation, has been my good friend and my brother. I, in fact, up to now, I've never typed rest in peace because it's very difficult for me to say that or to do that. So I'm not really happy. As you can see, we need prayers. Nollywood need prayers. People should pray for us so that it will stop. These things will stop. God should help us. It has never been there like that in the past, what is happening now. Now that the corpse has been recovered and three of them has been committed to Mother Earth according to the traditions of the land by the river bank, the guide has announced that there will be a candle procession tonight in honor of their colleagues. In Asaba, for New Central, I'm Austin Azu. Johnson & Johnson's Benelin Pediatric Syrup is facing a recall by the Nas National Agency for Food and Drugs Administration and Control, NAFDAC, due to concerning findings of toxicity. NAFDAC announced on its website that laboratory tests revealed a heightened level of diethylene glycol in the syrup, prompting acute oral toxicity in lab animals. The agency clarified that a product recall is a manufacturer's request to return a specific batch of entire production of a product due to safety concerns, design flaws, or labeling errors, according to online health portal Science Direct. Our NAFDAC urges caution among key players in the supply chain to prevent the circulation of compromised products. Those in possession of the affected Benelin pediatric syrup are advised to cease its sale or use immediately and submit stock to the nearest NAFDAC office. Furthermore, individuals witnessing adverse reactions in children after consuming the product are encouraged to seek immediate medical attention from qualified healthcare professionals. Now joining me on the news to discuss this is a consultant pediatrician, Dr. Ayodele Rena. Hello, doctor. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me on. Good evening. All right. Now, the supposed syrup, uh, the syrup's harmful content is diethylene glycol. Can you throw more light on it, please? Yes, yeah, so diethylene glycol is a hydrocarbon which is commonly used as a solvent for paints and dyes and is sometimes found to be present in cigarettes, but is generally not um, suitable for human consumption and is known to have certain unsavory side effects. Mm. All right, so, but then what are the potential health risks to children who may have consumed this contaminated syrup? So it can be anything ranging from no symptoms at all, and where symptoms do appear, because the amount of symptoms does depend on the quantity that is ingested or the quantity that the product was contaminated with. But it can be anything as simple as um, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. And then a second stage of the um, symptoms can involve kidney damage. So they would have very little urine, it have a rise in certain waste or toxic substances in their blood because the kidneys aren't excreting those substances. And then on the far aspect of things, it can be coma, paralysis, and ultimately death. All right. Now, Dr. Renner, can you tell us what immediate medical interventions should be sought of, you know, if a child exhibits adverse reactions, you know, uh, to, or symptoms to Benelin uh, pediatric syrup? Um, I, I like to just let people know that unfortunately this isn't something that you want to administer any kind of first aid at home for either like palm oil or anything. But if um, a parent has used this product and their child or their ward is experiencing any symptoms, then the first spot of call is to go to the hospital or the nearest healthcare facility for a qualified medical professional to examine and to run certain tests. They might even be needed to be observed to see if the condition might progress or improve and they'll take a decision based on that. 
All right, now, if this is not the first time that, you know, such uh, products uh, have actually been recalled, why does it keep, you know, happening? Why, why do we keep getting contaminated products into the market only for it to be recalled? Mm. So it really does have to do with everything in the value chain, right, from where it is manufactured, from the country in which it was imported. So um, there really does need to be international collaboration in terms of regulation of products and how the quality control measures are adhered to terms of manufacturing. Then when it is being imported, I believe that this product most likely had a NAFTA registration number and it was cleared for sale in Nigeria. And so there, something does need to be said about the um, thoroughness of the process by which drugs are tested and how quickly these tests are done. It's most likely that there'll probably be some preliminary tests for the most toxic substances. Something like this, I mean, I really would really like to hear from the, you know, the regulatory body in terms of how quickly these tests are done and if these tests are done here in Nigeria. Because my, I mean, my guess is that if these tests are not done in Nigeria, then it might take some time before some of these results become available and then the recall happens. It really does have to do with the entire value chain, right, from manufacturing, importation and registration and permission for the product to be sold here in Nigeria. All right. Now, what about children who have already consumed the syrup but are not showing any symptoms yet? Is there a medical advice that you can actually recommend for them? Mm, so the children who have consumed this syrup and don't have any symptoms should the parents should be, be vigilant. They should observe, and of course, they should not administer any further doses of drug. And if they notice that their children are having any unusual symptoms, particularly nausea and vomiting, or for those who can speak, complaints about abdominal pain, or if they notice that there's any reduction in the amount of we that the child is making, so if the child is having a reduced amount of urine, then that's a red flag that will suggest that you need to go to the hospital as soon as possible. But oh, nice. those who don't have any... Yes, oh, sorry, go, go on. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You're saying something. Yes, for those who don't have any symptoms, then please, yes, just be vigilant, just observe. If you notice any symptoms, then please go to the hospital. All right. Now, uh, you did say that, you know, in most cases, the uh, contamination actually comes from the supply chain. But in what ways can consumers themselves ensure the authenticity and also safety of the pharmaceutical products in light of this recall? Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's a, that's a very good question because um, at the end of the day, it's the end user that ends up suffering the consequences of these um, unfortunate events where products that are supposed to give health end up damaging one's health. And so what I'd say is that as by the challenges that we face as a nation of the NAVDAC is that regulatory body, I think NAVDAC really has done a good job in making sure that the majority of the drugs that are in circulation are actually safe and fit for use by the general population. But um, I guess my advice would be, please don't use any drugs that do not have a NAFTA number. Um, that really will give you a baseline for safety as far as the drugs that you're using is concerned. And if you do notice that you use a drug and you have any unusual effects, please make sure that know this and that you report to your physician or whoever it was that prescribed you preferably your physician because you really should um have you know drugs they, of course they are over-the-counter medications but for any drug prescribed by your physician please report back to your physician about the side effects that you're experiencing so that if it is not a side effect that is usual for that particular drug pharmacovigilance can be reported and action can be taken on what that drug might have um, caused all right, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rena, for joining us and enlightening us on this particular topic. We appreciate you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. All right, moving away from that, Nigerians across the country are voicing their concerns as they navigate a period of significant economic hardship. With inflation rates soaring and the cost of living on the rise, many are turning to financial literacy programs as a beacon of hope to guide them through these tumultuous times. Details in this report. From bustling city centers to rural communities, stories abound of citizens facing the harsh impact of economic downturns. 
Unprecedented hikes in prices of basic commodities, coupled with a depreciating currency, have left many Nigerians searching for strategies to cope with the financial strain. Why not? Why won't I save? I need to save. Because if I'm not save, if I'm not saving money, I'm not safe. So definitely I have to save. No matter how little I, I have to save. Because you cannot even you cannot even predict what is coming tomorrow. So if you don't save, you are in trouble. Okay, I'm saving. No, I will say cut your uh, cloth according to what? According to your pocket. If you know those are uh, sexy life you live, you cut it short. In this condition, present condition that we find ourselves in Nigeria, before you even get the money, the expenses is already down. So it's people find it so so difficult to save. But I, out of the hard economy, I think some people still do Nikolo. But for us like this, yeah, no save. Because before the money arrived, that's all. We don't spend it, spend it, spend it. House expenses, house rent, uh, this, that, mommy, daddy, paying this. The current economic climate in Nigeria has prompted a nationwide conversation about the importance of financial literacy. As families and individuals grapple with the realities of stretched budgets and dwindling savings, there is a growing recognition of the need for a better understanding of financial planning and management. In response to the outcry, non-governmental organizations, financial institutions and community groups have begun ramping up efforts to provide educational resources and workshops on budgeting, saving and investing. What is building the other advanced economy that we are going through? There are small, small businesses. But all those small businesses are not built by government or by large corporations. Mm -hmm. It's by individuals that start putting stuff together. But we don't have that knowledge. So everybody go to school, end up out of school and looking for employment. But when you teach people how to save and invest, then it helps them that by then they're out of school, they're able to, you know, think out of the box. On its part, the Nigerian government has made efforts to promote financial education as the CBN implements financial literacy programs. Despite these efforts, there's still a long road ahead. Access to financial literacy resources remains uneven, particularly in remote areas where information and education are not readily available. To a large extent, it's not evenly shared. There are a lot of drivers to you getting that financial literacy, quote and unquote. It has to do with access to internet, which is not even evenly shared in the country. The internet penetration in Nigeria is quite low. So for places where we have high internet penetration, you get to the access to information is quite easy, quite accessible compared to areas where the internet penetration is quite low. So if you are not financially literate to know, oh, this is what to do to invest, if you don't take that discipline that put, definitely you will always be under the water. And that's why I say we are not doing, as the government, as the people, as individuals, we are not doing more than enough to ensure that we reach this financial literacy gap. The crisis has shed light on the fundamental role that financial knowledge plays in navigating economic challenges. As the nation looks forward, the focus on financial education not only offers hope for individual financial health, but also for the nation's economic recovery and growth. The South African Independence Electoral Commission has approached the Apex Court of South Africa for clarity on Section 47 of the Constitution following a court order by the Electoral Court that set aside its decision to let former President and leader of Nkunto Esizwe, Jacob Zuma, to contest the upcoming elections. According to Section 47 of the Constitution, a candidate cannot be elected if they have been convicted. Previously, Jacob Zuma was convicted and served not more than two months in jail. In its statement, the Commission says its decision for an urgent appeal to the Constitutional Court is to get clarity on this matter from the highest court. Now, this comes irregardless of the IEC publishing the final list of candidates to be on the ballot paper. The Commission confirms that uh, it has lost uh, papers on an urgent uh, basis directly to the Constitutional Court to appeal the orders of the Concord uh, relating to the MK matter um, regarding the erstwhile uh, President's uh, candidature. The basis of the appeal is to obtain clarity on the correct legal interpretation of Section 147 1E of the Constitution, 
so that there is absolute clarity for all role players and that there is legal certainty so that the Commission is placed in a position for purposes of this election but as well as for the future to ensure that we apply that provision of the Constitution evenly across all role players. And we wish to take uh, the moment to emphasize that by taking this decision, the Commission is not intending to enter into the political playing field, rather to uh, uh, obtain clarity from the highest court in the land which court has um, constitutional matter jurisdiction. Now to further discuss this, I am joined by MK spokesperson Lamulo Ndelela. Hello Lamulo, thank you so much for joining me. Good evening and good evening to your viewers. Good evening. So Lamulo, can you tell us how ready is the MK as a newly formed party for the upcoming elections? Well, we, we are very ready. We have a machinery that is operating very well throughout all the provinces. Um, as you may or may not know, we have uh, qualified as per the prescripts uh, set out by the IEC um, regarding um, you know, meeting signatures for representation, including the ability to contest at a provincial level. Uh, we are proud to say that we covered all the provinces um, and that we will be able to, or should we say, members of this country, members of this party, uh, citizens, civil society, traditional leaders, religious leaders, anyone that is patriotic and seeing change in this country, be able to vote in all provinces. Okay. Now, uh, but what is your manifesto and why is it important for South Africans to vote for you? Well, uh, South Africa's got a history um, where um, our problem started in the 1652 when uh, the Jan van Riebeck landed, uh, you know, in, on our land, and uh, including the British. And everything from then uh, went south. I mean, you know, our, our kindness was taken for granted, to be honest. Um, however, you know, we now sit in a situation as a country where we have a constitution um, that is based on Roman Dutch law. Now, we are Africans. No, we're not Roman, neither are we Dutch. So what we want is we want uh, a constitution that is reflective of the natives. Um, you know, for instance, uh, there's a number of issues that, 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 as it pertains to that. Um, issues around basic education. You know, why, why can't we have quality education? So th there's a number of elements that we would like to change. For instance, the other element is we need to nationalize the Reserve Bank. It cannot be that our sovereignty is owned by, um, you know, a family in Germany. They are shareholders of our National Reserve Bank. It, it can't be. Mm. Uh, we're saying that, you know, our, we need to protect our sovereignty. And in order to protect our sovereignty, we change the constitution, we nationalize the Reserve Bank, we nationalize the mines, and ensure that, uh, you know, South Africans and the African child gets beneficiation of the back of the resources uh, that come with this land. So we want the land back that was stolen uh, off the back of the arrival of the visitors of 1652. And uh, we need to change this constitution. If you think about it, most African countries, you know, I doubt that you'll find a situation where their, their constitutions are based on Roman Dutch law. And if that is the case, you know, they should be fighting as Africans and we should be fighting for our space. This right. is our country. These yeah. are our resources. We need to ensure that the Constitution meets our requirements. All right. Quite understood, Lamulo. But then on Tuesday, the Electoral <laughs> Court ruled in favor of your party, uh, but uh, it ruled in favor of MK. Uh, but this morning, the IEC released a statement uh, stating that they're approaching the Constitutional Court. What do you make of this step by the IEC? Do you think that their move is politically motivated? Well, you, you put it very eloquently that you're correct. This is a political move, and we now are starting to question where are they getting their instructions from? Here's the reality. Um, the IEC goes and, you know, upholds an objection 
uh, of which, by the way, let's take into consideration, out of all political parties that submitted parliamentary lists, if you were to consolidate all the candidates, there's about 15,000. President Zuma, in this case, is the only one who has had an objection against him out of all 15,000. That alone is telling. Then you have a situation where they want to use Section 47 e of the Constitution, um, you know, that talks to uh, eligibility of a member as it pertains to the National Assembly. When they, as the IEC, the, Inter the Inter Independent Electoral uh, Commission, ought to be using the laws as a provisions uh, or within their provisions. So they want to invoke in what is what they're doing. They uh, upheld an objection off the back of using a law that it gives powers to the National Assembly mm. for membership. Their responsibility is to focus on whether the person is fit to meet the requirements as it pertains to being a candidate. All right. So already they were operating by virtue of invoking that law outside the jurisdiction without authority and without mandate. And that's what we questioned and that's how we won our case. Now, the mere fact that they go to the All right, uh, Lamulo, constitutional court. I, I really court. apologize. We'll have to stop you here. Time isn't on our side. But thank you so much for you know shedding more light and also speaking to us on this. We really, really appreciate you for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to us. Thank you. Now, moving away from that, the United Nations has warned that the humanitarian crisis triggered by the conflict in Sudan could worsen dramatically in the coming months, tipping some regions into famine. UN agencies said the emergency could also further spill into neighboring African countries unless the fighting ends. The UN said this ahead of Monday's first anniversary of the conflict erupting. Fighting in Sudan broke out on April 15th last year between the regular army and the paramilitary rapid support forces. The conflict has killed thousands and sparked a humanitarian disaster. More than 8.5 million people have fled their homes, with nearly 1.8 million escaping across the country's borders. The news resumes after the break. Stay. Now in business, under the leadership of President Tinubu, Nigeria has experienced a remarkable economic turnaround as reported by Bloomberg UK. The Nigerian Naira has emerged as the world's best performing currency since March 2024, a testament to the strategic initiatives and policies implemented by President Tinubu's ACE team consisting of Adedeji, Cardoso and Edun. Through their collaborative efforts, the ACE team has played a pivotal role in stabilizing the Naira and boosting investor confidence. Their commitment to significant economic reforms and adherence to global best practices has yielded positive outcomes. Nigeria has demonstrated a strong commitment to sustainable growth and development, attracting foreign investment and fostering economic stability what is in the budget uh, for the year 2024. Um, uh, at the beginning of the year, um, the government drew the budget for the year. And uh, on the budget sheet, we have a budget deficit of uh, over uh, close to $9 trillion, uh, that we need to raise in the market. And um, uh, out of that, uh, about $7.8 trillion will need to be raised in the local market. And um, um, between January and now, the um, uh, DMO has been able to raise about two point um, about two point three trillion uh, in the market. So uh, it's just in continuation of um, of the program for the year. So it's still not out of place. It's within the the uh, budget. Now in the world of sports, in a harrowing incident near Munich. Three of football stars Harry Kane's children were rushed to the hospital following a car crash. Authorities report, however, said that none of the children sustained more than minor injuries, dubbing them really lucky amidst the ordeal. Kane was absent from Germany at the time, having traveled to London for Bayern Munich's crucial Champions League fixture against Arsenal. Details emerging from the scene reveal that Kane's children were traveling in a Mercedes van when a Renault uh, vehicle collided with it, subsequently striking a Land Rover. Kane's children, Louise 3, Vivienne 5, and Ivy 7 were in the Mercedes car. 
Despite the severity of the crash, all nine individuals involved, including the occupants of the three cars, escaped serious harm. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of our major stories. We told you that Boko Haram insurgents killed 27 fishermen on nigeria Cameroon border. We also told you that UN warns of worsening humanitarian crisis in Sudan. Finally, you heard that South Africa's Electoral Commission turns to Constitutional Court over Zuma's eligibility to contest. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Time channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Darshan Usman.